everyone. Today I am here with Nikki McGraw. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Kathleen. I'm super stoked to be with you. Absolutely. So for those of you who don't know Nikki, Nikki is a vocal pedagogue and performer specializing in contemporary commercial music styles. Her teaching philosophy is equal parts joy and science and is grounded in free, efficient, sustainable voice use. What I love about Nikki's work is that it is science and pedagogy based, but it is super accessible and enjoyable. When Nikki and I were both invited to present at a seminar, I had the opportunity to learn about her teaching content and style, and I found Found that we were passionate about many of the same things. So if you'd like to know more about Nikki or how to work with her, check out the about section below this video. One of the things that, that I love, and I know that Nikki loves too, is myth busting. There's a lot of information out there and a lot of it came from a really good spot, but it's kind of like a game of telephone where it, it trickled down and got distilled into a place that wasn't necessarily science, wasn't necessarily helpful. So we're going to address a few of those things today. Sound good? Oh, that sounds awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's a whole lot of the reason why I became who I am today professionally. I was a really confused singer, had a lot of questions about the voice. So I was like, I'll just go and do a master's degree so you don't have to. Perfect, yeah. I love that. That's that's exactly what we're doing here today. So I'm going to jump right in with my first question. One of the most common questions and comments I get in my work are from people who want to know more about breathing. And of course, from people who were raised with or hung on to the term that they were taught in maybe high school choir, which was breathe from the diaphragm. I'm sure you've heard that. And I will let you just pull that concept apart and run with it. Oh, breathing. What a topic to start with. A whole can of worms there, my friends. And I think that uh, if you put a room full of voice teachers together, they would all have slightly different responses or maybe really different responses in terms of the way they approach breathing for singing. But let's let's just talk about the diaphragm for right now. So we don't breathe into or from the diaphragm. Why is that? Well, the diaphragm's a muscle. It's a sheet-like muscle that separates our heart and our lungs from the rest of our vital organs. And it's actually a primary muscle of inhalation. So that means when we breathe in, the diaphragm is helping with that by contracting down. And that moves our, yeah, yeah, from the sternum down, flattening a little bit, pushing our vital organs or our tummy bits down and out a bit. So primary muscle of the breath in, and it's relaxing or releasing on the breath out. The breath out is the bit where we're speaking or singing. So we're not actually using the diaphragm for our actual singing. I love that. And I'm just gonna like very small cul-de-sac here. When I was in college and I took a biology class, there was a trigger warning, like body part internal things we had a day where it was like attendance optional but we got to go see a cadaver and of course i know i was a trumpet player and i'd heard this forever and ever and i was like where's the diaphragm can i see it <laughs> and so they did this and i was like oh wow and the thing that it reminded me of is one of those red rubber handballs oh yeah right so you got that dome and it's just kind of like membrane ropey mm, muscle it just reminded me of that rubber like a rubber ball and it gave me such new perspective on where it lives and what it does it's hard to imagine that sometimes but seeing it right there in its little dome right underneath the kind of outlining the bottom of the rib cage and i pushed on it to see what it felt like and i was like that makes so much more sense it is it is muscly it's muscly. Absolutely. Yeah. I had, I, well, in my, in my grad studies, doing my master's in voice ped, we also had the opportunity to go to the wet labs and inspect cadavers and look at all different dissections, including the diaphragm. And I already had a pretty solid understanding of the anatomy and physiology, but seeing it in context of the body was really, really incredible. Um, a challenging experience in a lot of ways, but learned a lot that day yeah absolutely i'm i'm yeah. glad that we uh that we both experienced that it's a kind of a strange thing yeah. to talk about but it's one of those things it that is. 
until you really see it or have a really good understanding of what it is, it's hard to conceptualize. You've had people your whole life saying, sing from your diaphragm. Mm. Yeah. And on that as well, the diaphragm is largely an involuntary muscle. Its function is automatic. We don't need to think about moving our diaphragm because that's part of our survival. It functions for our survival. So we're not really strengthening it at any point either. We're not like bulking up our diaphragm through singing exercises. We're building coordination and fine motor skills, but it's largely involuntary muscle. We can control it by doing things like holding our breath or consciously taking a breath in and knowing that it's moving, but that's kind of it. I love that. And I talk about coordination all the time because I think the coordination is so central to what we do and using the word coordination rather than strength, I think allows the relaxation to happen because there are all the other muscles that are connected to it, right? And those Absolutely. are the ones that I like to be mindful of. Oh, I love that. You're speaking my love language. <laughs> my love language is proper vocal pedagogy. How about yours? <laughs> oh my gosh, that's some that's some niche humor right there. <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> Shifting to a new topic then. As with many activities, there are some folks who think that their way, the way that they were trained, the way that they were brought up is the only way or the best way to do things. In this case, singing. What do you think of the statement, Classical training is the best training for all styles of music, and it is how you build a healthy technique. Oh, another one, another can of worms. What a day. What a day. <laughs> well, I think that classical technique is valid. I think classical technique has lots of strengths to it. I think classical training and technique is wonderful for people who are singing in Western art music styles. However, I really, really strongly disagree that it is the healthiest way or the only way or the best way, especially when we're moving into our pop and rock styles or microphone styles or musical theater, for example, because some of the things that we're trained to do in Western art music are very specific to that and can get in the way of some of the things we stylistically want to achieve in other styles. Noting my audience, can you just a, a sentence? What is Western art music? What do you put under that umbrella? Mm, so classical music that is largely from Europe, broadly speaking. Mm -hmm. So things like opera, things like singing arias, all of those sorts of things are, are part of classical or Western art music, whatever term you prefer. So, you know, in, in classical training or Western art training, there are lots of things we do um, or train not to do because they're considered vocal faults, not a term that I love, but that's kind of what it is. Um, things like singing with anything, but like a, a lower larynx setting, things like singing with vibrato. Uh, so singing with like, depending on the style, um, vibrato that's delayed or minimized vibrato that would be a vocal tends to be a vocal fault a lot of the time things like glottal onsets or breathy onsets like ah uh, ah uh, ah uh, or ha 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 those would be considered vocal faults and yet in musical theater and contemporary music styles there are absolutely things that we want to be able to have as options and explore also for the most part in classical training we need a a breathing style that's going to allow us to sing really long legato lines and to be heard uh, unamplified, so without a microphone over an orchestra. When we move into shorter conversational phrases, like we do in musical theater and contemporary styles, we actually need to breathe a little differently. And when we go down the rabbit hole of things like belt quality, we actually need a lot less breath. Like, low breath flow rather than taking a lot of breath and having too much below our vocal folds that kind of limits their ability to come together in the coordination that they need to sustain that really highly energized sound in a speech dominant quality so i'm sure a bunch of minds just exploded <laughs> because i think so many people are more air more air more air more air more air what i'm hearing from you is more coordination more awareness of what you're trying to achieve 
and how breath interacts with that. Can you speak to the more air uh, thing that we hear so often? Yeah, absolutely. I think more air, it's not something I would say never to say to a singer. I think there is room for that sometimes being the instruction. I think that having a consistent breath flow is absolutely what we're looking for from most of our singing styles. So pulling out the word breath. consistent. So the, the, the words I'm hearing floating to the top, consistent coordination. Right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So we're looking for that consistent breath flow and building that as our coordination. We're uh, also looking to use, mm, depending on what we're doing, we just need to breathe in a little less. So when we breathe to speak, we're not going, hello, how are you today? I'm <laughs> doing just... great, how are you over there? And you can hear my vocal folds just flying apart because it's sounding breathy, it's sounding a little manufactured. Um, it feels really uncomfortable in my body. Uh, and yet to breathe to speak, I'm not really thinking about it. I know that I'm actually breathing a lot less. And for singing in our contemporary styles, we need about that much breath, maybe a little bit more, depending on the vocal task that we're doing. I think having flexibility in our coordination is absolutely the priority. I don't believe that there's one best way to breathe. I think there are many ways that we can approach breathing for singing. And the same applies to our our vocal configuration or how we set up our larynx and how we use it. Mm. That's great. So nothing innately good or bad about larynx position more of what is appropriate to the genre you're singing is, am I understanding you correctly? Completely nailed it. Absolutely, yes. Love that so much. All right, so let's move on to another topic because it's can of worms day. This one blows my mind a little bit because well, let's just say that many of us learned about this one incorrectly. So I'll preface this with even vocal pedagogues don't have full alignment or agreement on a lot of vocal pedagogy. But we have so much great technology now. We can use high-tech imaging. We have um, like video MRIs to see what's really happening inside of our vocal mechanism. So this topic is that of the term mixed voice. So what do you have to say about mixed voice? Maybe we should start with what people understand it as a little bit, Mm -hmm. like how it gets used or misused and kind of what you think it is or isn't. Absolutely. So Mixed voice is a term that we use when we're talking about a voice quality that sits somewhere between our speech register. Some people call it chest register. Some people refer to it as M0 or thick, uh, M1, sorry, or thick folds. And our upper register, also sometimes known as head register or thin folds or M2, if you like. And mixed voice sits kind of in the middle and sounds like a mix of the two. Uh, So you'll hear this a lot in pop songs. You'll hear this a lot in musical theater, um, especially as we're moving through those transition points across registers. If you wanna know a little bit more about registers and registration, check out this video that I did with Kai Outerbridge because we talked a lot about this. We talked about mode one and mode two and head voice and chest voice. This is going to fold nicely into that conversation. I loved that conversation too. That was absolutely awesome. Glad and so that. if you take, yeah, take some of that and it's basically the land in the middle. Um, and so we get a vocal output that's a mixture between a speech-like quality and a loftier or hootier quality that we get in our upper register. So what is mixed voice? Well, it's not a vocal register. Uh, It's actually a coordination across two different registers. And we do that by being really clever and coordinated in our use of our voice. And we can do that laryngeally and also acoustically in the vocal tract, playing around with different styles of resonance. Uh, So there are lots of different ways that we can achieve it. And I don't, I mean, pedagogically, I don't really love the term mixed voice, um, especially when it comes to any kind of conversation around registration. Um, That said, I do work with musical theatre performers and I, I teach them. And within that industry in particular, we do hear mix used a lot. And we talk about different kinds of mix. We'll talk about 
a mix belt quality, we'll talk about a mix voice quality, we'll talk about a heady mix. And these are just terms that are being used in that industry right now, whether I like it or not. So <laughs> we will sometimes use it when I'm talking with those individuals. However, I also like to teach singers about what it is and what it isn't so that they can be really empowered in their practice and also have a stronger awareness of how they can achieve that plethora of different sounds in their singing. What I loved about what you just said is number one, we're being clever with our voice. We, I think the, the, the place that we love to use the word mixed voice, mixed register is so that people don't necessarily hear that discernible break as we're going from chest voice to head voice, right? So as we yeah. approach our higher chest voice, we might do clever things to make it sound like the register that we're about to head into. So from a, a feeling perspective, some people aren't gonna notice that really big shift, right? So to the average singer who, who doesn't necessarily want to study all of those video MRIs, uh, the sensation might feel like mix, but I think it's important to say scientifically, we're going between two different modes using our vocal folds, but there's a ton we can do, like you said, to modulate what's happening in the vocal tract and in kind of the, the mouth, the filter area to make those sounds the color that you want them to be. Totally, absolutely. Um, just like Kai talked about in the last video, there's the, the TA muscle or the shortener muscle and the CT, the lengthener muscle. And they have an antagonistic friendship. And so it's about how we find the relationship between them where they get to hand the baton to each other really smoothly so that we are disguising those registration events. So yeah, they can both be doing things for lots of notes within our vocal range. I love that. Can we take a very brief moment for just one more topic? I'll offer you a somewhat loaded question if you are willing. I'm and ready. <laughs> all right, here we go. What causes vocal injuries? Is that just from bad technique or lack of solid training? Oh, I just, I just wanna hug all of the singers and people out there who've had vocal injuries because it's a really tough time. And I think as singers, we are incredibly hard on ourselves and the industry can also be really tough on us too. Vocal injury is not your fault as a singer. It can arise short, it can arise from misuse of the instrument. That's still not your fault. So there are things that we can do to look after our voice and care for our voice and keep it really healthy. But if you do have a voice injury or if things aren't functioning as they usually would, know that there's support out there for you. Definitely go and speak with your doctor, speak with a voice person who is trained in looking after um, singers with a voice injury and uh it's gonna be okay there is there is help out there for you if that is you where should people not? go where should people go if they're having vocal oh. trouble yeah so there are there are voice teachers and then there are also voice teachers who have specialist training in different areas of the voice including voice injury or voice habilitation people who work as a vocology team with people like speech pathologists and ents or otolaryngologists. Uh, so starting there with a trusted voice educator, also talking to your family doctor or general practitioner to get a referral onto specialists, absolutely. Um, a good rule of thumb is if your voice is playing up for three weeks after having been unwell, then it's time to go and, and get some specialist help, yeah. That three weeks sounds like a really good guideline because people are always like, I don't know, should I just give it a couple of days? I just had a cold, something is happening. Olaf is wanting to be part of this and is a little bit wiggly right now. <laughs> he's like, hold me, but don't hold me too hard. Okay, now he's in my lap. <laughs> That's the lady. I think, I think we can continue. I have a cat in my lap. I'm here for that. I think as singers, we are athletes, we are vocal athletes. And if we think about our sporting athlete friends and what happens to them when they're injured, well, I live in Canada and hockey's kind of a really big deal here. And injuries in hockey are very common. And when a player is injured, they're just out and they're getting rehabilitated and there isn't really taboo about it. I think the same 
should be said for singers as well. We should have that grace and that room to heal without taboo or judgment. Uh, but right, back what you said before, it's, little... it's not your fault. So don't, yeah. wh why be weird about it? Yeah, we've got a little ways to go on that one culturally, but I think, I think we're going to get there. We're on the right path. We're on the right path. Yeah. Oh, hello there, Olaf. Let's just talk about how cute you are for the rest of this time, hey? You're very sweet. We would sweet. be totally fine with that. <laughs> well, that was a ton of fun. Thank you so much for joining me today, Nikki. Thank you so much, Kathleen. It's been really great to spend time with you again, and I'm looking forward to seeing more of your videos soon. Absolutely. Talk soon. Bye. Again, if you'd like to know more about Nikki and the work that she's doing, please check out the links below. Thank you for watching. This is Olaf. Olaf! Oh my gosh! He's Hi. just a big old hunk of athlete and mischief. Oh my gosh, he's so sweet. So he <laughs> may, we may see him running around a little bit. I'm, I'm very here for that. Olaf's going to steal the show and that's fine by me. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, hopefully his sneeze settles soon. Yes. <laughs> so, um, I don't think we have to do, oh, he is literally licking a lamp right now. <laughs> I can't even. Where'd you go, buddy? Yeah. Okay. He stopped licking the lamp. Tasty.